And now, please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, what a glorious day it is today. <laughs> a great day to celebrate Earth Day, you know, the rain. I prefer to see it in a positive context, bathing the ground to give forth new life. Earth Day is a great time and certainly gives us an opportunity to think about the beauty of the natural world. And also, one thing I'd like to do is celebrate some of the achievements that we've seen in the environmental movement. I don't know about you, but when we think about the environment, I do like to hear about good news. Consider for a moment all the wonderful national parks we have, state parks we have, municipal parks. These parks were not always around. This was not always a part of our national society. It all grew out of that first environmental movement in the early 20th century. We have people like John Weir and Teddy Roosevelt and so many others to thank for the wonderful parks that we have and we all enjoy. One thing we can celebrate on a day like today. Now the second environmental movement was of course of a very different character, but it's also something that I'd like to celebrate. When I taught at Groton School, I coached rowing on the Nashua River. One of the older teachers who had been at Groton back in the 1950s told me that when he was a boy at the school, you could tell what the tannery upstream was making based on the color of the river. They would dump their industrial byproduct untreated into the Nashua. The same thing, of course, held true for the Charles River and Boston Harbor. I mean, they literally made a song in the 1970s about Boston titled Dirty Water. It's hard to believe that leaded gasoline actually used to be a thing. We were putting high concentrations of lead, which we knew to be extremely dangerous to health, into the, day, into the air daily. You can see those photos, I'm sure, of all the smog of the 1970s. I'm sure you can see those images in your head. Then we have Rachel Carson's famous book, Silent Spring, which revealed the dangers of DDT, the, the pesticide most commonly used to kill mosquitoes, bedbugs, and other things. It poisoned the bugs that birds, ate, that birds ate, leading to major defects in young birds. And I'm sure you've seen those images. It's still, again, one of these images that shocks me to see the images of some kids playing behind the trucks that are spewing DDT into the environment in suburban America. Think about the images, for those of you who are old enough to remember, the images of the 1969 Santa Monica oil spill, where on the beaches of California you had crude oil, as far as the eye can see. or the very famous Cuyahoga River fire in Ohio that same year, where the river, where the, the pollution on the river literally caught fire. The second environmental movement gave it, has had some remarkable achievements, and it's worthwhile noting and lifting those up. I mean, it gave us the EPA, the Clean Water Act, both of which have helped transform our environment. It gave us Earth Day, which we celebrate this weekend. The peak of the second environmental movement was probably the Montreal P Protocol of 1987, when nations across the globe agreed to limit the chemicals that contributed to the depletion of the ozone layer. That is amazing. That kind of international cooperation? And it should give us hope for the resilience of the, resiliency of the, national, of the natural environment and also our very real ability that we have to make things better. There's a lot to celebrate, but of course there's also more work to be done. I'm sure you've all read about the PFAS, chemicals that are in our drinking water. We have all consumed those chemicals. They are in everything from Teflon to Gore-Tex. And now we are finally, at long last, taking moves to try and limit them, albeit some 20 plus years after the company that made these chemicals knew that they were harmful to human health. But the more looming crisis, of course, the one that dominates our discourse and has reshaped the environment movement over the past 30 years, is the climate crisis. And we're going to need the optimism that we have from the successes of those first two envir environmental movements as we face this current crisis. Because as we all know, the climate change crisis and what we do about it has proven to be somewhat trickier than these past movements. Now, the logic of climate change is about as straightforward as it gets. If you take fossil fuels and burn them, you are putting stuff into the environment. Over the past 200 years, we've been burning fossil fuels at a rate that has been bound to have an impact on our environment. 
Only the most naive person would claim that it would have zero impact at all. The tricky part comes when we try to model that impact and then, more importantly, figure out what to do about it. Now, if there is a bad guy, now these efforts have been made more difficult by folks like Lee Raymond. If there is a bad guy in the fight against climate change, Lee Raymond's name certainly should be near the top of the list. Raymond was the CEO of Exxon and later ExxonMobil from 1993 to 2005. And Exxon had some excellent scientists in back in the 1980s who knew and charted the dangers of greenhouse gases. And Lee Raymond also knew that this was bad for the bottom line of Exxon, and so he proceeded to fund research with the express purpose of casting doubt on the conclusions of climate science. And since modeling, scientific modeling, uh, when you, in regards to something like the climate is incredibly complex, it's not that difficult to bring up certain things that make you question or create doubt. The, rip the ripple effects of Lee Raymond's efforts, of course, can be seen with any cursory Google search into the anti-climate change research. But even when you admit the reality and danger of climate change, the far harder question is, what are we supposed to do about it? First off, there are obvious trade-offs in limiting greenhouse gases. Fossil fuels still provide the cheapest energy source in the world. That has given us incredible economic output that we've seen over the past 200 years. Literally billions have been lifted out of poverty because of the burning of fossil fuels. Our entire modern, modern economy is built on them. Literally, like the whole thing is built on fossil fuels. To dramatically cut fossil fuel use, which we need to do, according to scientists, to stave off the worst of the climate crisis, would mean a severe drop in economic output. And this is particularly true for poorer countries who cannot afford to switch to greener sources of fuel. Then there is the classic tragedy of the commons. Are we supposed to cut emissions unilaterally and take the economic hit while others do not? On top of that, there is uncertainty about how and when the worst of the effects of climate change will appear. We simply don't know that. Will there be technological advances, like, say, cold fusion or efficient carbon capture that solve the problem for us? That might very well happen. When I was thinking about the uncertainty of these models, one thing came to mind in Houston was the advent of fracking. Before fracking, if you remember, the price of oil was going up and up and up, and it was certain that all of a sudden we would have a dramatic shift towards greener forces, sources of fuel. Then new technology came on the on the scene in the course of fracking, and that changed the equation. But it also meant for abundant and cheap natural gas, which actually lowered greenhouse gas emissions for the United States. Predicting these things is not easy. There is uncertainty involved. And so there it is, our, envir our, env our environmental crisis and the complexity of it, or at least some of the complexity of it. And so what are we supposed to do about it? Personally, I'm an optimist. I celebrate the fact that both humans and the natural world have a tremendous capacity for change and adaptation. I look at the past successes of the environmental movement, and I believe that we have it within us to find a way forward. There is something, however, that gives me pause. A number of years ago, I read Jared Diamond's book, Collapse. I don't know how many of you have read that book. Diamond is an anthropologist, which means he studies human society particularly in its most ancient or most primitive forms. In the book, he wanted to see what led to societal collapse. He's not talking about societal decline. Societies and nations go into decline for all sorts of reasons. Ancient Rome, the British Empire, some would say American society today, have gone through periods of extended decline. No, what Diamond researched was, was societies that had sudden and calamitous collapses that left utter devastation in their wake. He looked at the ancient Mayan civilization on the Yucatan Peninsula, the society on Easter Island off the Ecuadorian coast, and the, Anas and the Anasazi in the American Southwest. In each of these cases, he carefully pieced together the archaeological records to try and figure out what happened, what led to this collapse. And in each situation, he, find that he found that ecological stress led to sudden changes in the availability of food and water for the population. That sudden shift in available food res resources led to societal upheaval and collapse. It turns out that it's difficult to have civilization and law and order when people don't have food. 
Diamond also looked at those societies that could have collapsed, they had the conditions for it, and yet they did not, like Greenland. What was the difference? Why did some societies collapse and some somehow sustain themselves? The answer he found was that some cultures were able to accurately assess the dangers they, they faced and then implement public policies to mitigate, to mitigate the worst outcomes. Others, other societies, were just not able to do that. They failed to adjust because the ruling class was more interested in short-term protection of their power and resources than sober long-term planning. And religion plays a part in all this. For those societies that face collapse, the religious establishment was all too often co-opted by the ruling classes to defend their interests and blame the gods or some other supernatural cause or scapegoat for society's ills. Now what scares me about our current environmental crisis is that there is a real and legitimate threat to basic food, predict, food production if certain climate models prove correct, which of course we don't know if they will. There is a real chance, for instance, that as the oceans warm, the currents that move water from the equatorial region to the north and bring cold water back south will stop. For us, that means the Atlantic Gulf Stream might cease functioning. And this could happen fairly quickly in terms of it's working and then in a relatively short period of time, it stops working. And if that happens, there'll be a precipitous decline in, in temperatures in the northern parts of the globe, like the one we're in. In a place like England, it will be even more severe. This sudden change in temperatures would lead to a rapid decline in food production. And we would see, in a way that we have not for many, many, many years, widespread and global famine. That would dramatically destabilize governments and societies. It would not be pretty. Or take another, another example. As the glaciers in the Himalayas melt, the rivers that they feed, like the Yangtze and the Indus River, among others, would dry up or become seasonal. This would severely affect the availability of food in India, Pakistan, and China three nuclear powers that are home to some three billion people. It's not hard to conceive of some pretty negative consequences as those rivers begin to dry up. Now, I could cite other examples as well, but I think you get the point. There is a chance, I need to say this is a chance, not a certainty, that our current trajectory will lead not to gradual changes in climate adaptation, but to sudden and irrevocable societal collapse. Yay, happy news. I'm so glad you came to church on Sunday. Uh, now, we are only a small group of people. We do not have the power to avert this climate crisis. But as Christians, there are some very real things we can do to do our part. And as Jared Diamond points out, religious people and leaders do have an effect on public policy and public perceptions. So it's up to us to think what role can we play. Now, one of the best-known American theologians of the 20th century was the UCC theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. Niebuhr spent the majority of his career as a professor at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, back when it was the preeminent seminary in the United States. He was so popular that he even graced the cover of Time magazine back in the 1950s. Now, Niebuhr was raised at a time when liberal theology was at its peak. This, this was a movement in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that focused on the teachings of the historical Jesus and boiled down the Christian message to the law of love. You should love one another as God has loved you. It is that simple. We repeat that every morning in the summary of the law. Well, in Niebuhr's view, that's an admirable goal for interpersonal relationships, but the law of love does not work so well when you stretch it out to a societal level. Turns out, at a societal level, the strong take advantage of the weak. People will identify with their group and their nation over the interests of others. Therefore, love cannot function on its own in a societal context, according to Niebuhr. It needs also to be built on justice. Love should be the highest end of any system, but without justice, you cannot get there. Justice demands that people honor the just claims of others. That requires people to see their self-interest and to be honest about it. And all of this, of course, according to Niebuhr, needs to be encompassed by love. But you need to balance justice into the mix. Now, this has major implications for Christians in regard to climate change. Yes, we need love. We need to love all people. But we also need to discern, or try to discern, where the demands of justice lie. Americans have, per capita, put, put far more greenhouse gases into the environment than others. What are the implications of this in terms of justice? 
Justice likely demands that as we move forward, America should take the lead on cutting these admissions as a result of that. Now, that's a tough pill to swallow. Christian voices, according to Niebuhr, need to be able to name our self-interest with integrity, which is not easy to do, and seek after justice. The effects of climate change will fall disproportionately on those who are poor. What can we do to mitigate that? Where does justice demand that we act? These aren't easy questions. I'm not trying to say that they are. But as Christians, we, we should seek to answer them. We should seek to answer, what does justice look like, honestly? And how do we think about that? So for instance, there have been articles recently that have highlighted about billionaires flying around in private, private jets and big yachts and how much those pollute. Should justice demand that those things be regulated? But then, of course, Americans per capita burn far more fossil fuels than people in other countries. Does that mean Americans should be regulated? Is that, what, is that what's just? Or maybe this is something that's unjust to try and do that. Honestly, these are open questions. I'm not trying to claim that I have an answer for you. But I'm saying we should ask them. One question I've been wrestling with is, is it time finally for me to be a vegetarian? <laughs> One person has particularly told me this multiple times. How do we wrestle with these issues? They are moral issues. This is a place, a church is a place where we ask moral questions. Now, but the Christian response can do more than simply ask what is just and have the courage to name our own self-interest. <clears throat> our theological framework, theology, theology plays a role. See, it's great, you love theology. If you don't love it now, you will. <laughs> theology shapes how people interact with the natural world. In the early 1980s, Ronald Reagan's Secretary of the Interior, James Watt, famously claimed that since Jesus is going to return again soon, we don't need to focus on the environment. <laughs> Why care about the environment when the world won't be around much longer? That is one obvious example where our theology affects how people relate to the natural world. But the issue runs far deeper than a belief in the Second Coming. The Western theological tradition has been deeply influenced by Greek thought, particularly Plato and Platonism, as well as certain interpretations of the Bible. These systems have created a dualism between mind and body, between mind and matter. On a personal level, these systems say we need to control the desires of the body. The desires of the body are seen as bad or at least subordinate to the mind. And this dualism extends to the natural world as well. On a societal level, you need to subdue nature and bend nature to your will. The environment is something to be controlled, created in our image, dominated. Nature has no claims of its own. It's merely created matter. Now, this classic view also sees God as wholly other and apart from the natural world. God is transcendent up there in heaven. The natural world is a place of suffering and sin. Our goal should be to elevate our minds and, and souls to God and the transcendent. Now, in the 1970s, theologians began to question the dominance of this mind-body dualism and its implication for our, implications for our lives. They sought to find integration between the mind and body. The desires of the body are not all evil, sinful, and meant to be controlled. Our bodies are holy and not distinct from our minds. Similarly, ecological theologians argued that we have to see the interrelated nature of humans in the natural world. We are all a part of God's creation. It is not humans versus nature, but humans as a part of nature. God is not up there apart from the world. God is actually in the world, imminent, present around us. The natural world is infused with God's very presence. In this new framework, we need to be in covenant with nature. We should not dominate and control nature, but live in harmony with nature and the divine that is around us. And there's a lot more to be said about this ecological theology. If you have questions, just ask. I can give you some good books to read. But I hope you can see how theology does matter for creation care, and it can shape how we interact with the natural world. If God is present in and through every, everything and everyone, then you cannot wantonly destroy the environment without also harming a part of God. If all of nature is a part of God's plan, then we need to care for our planet. Other theological traditions, particularly indigenous traditions, have long valued creation because they have seen the divine in creation. Can Christians do the same? If we did, 
How might it affect our lives? One key element in this is for, us, for all of us to try and seek a deeper connection with nature. It is no surprise that the most ardent environmentalists are those who, te who tend to spend a lot of time in the natural world. They appreciate the divine beauty found in the woods, in their gardens, and the plants and animals around them. People who are in touch with the natural world and its energy tend to be more connected and often far happier than those who see, nat who, than those who see nature as simply something to be used. That connection with nature can motivate and sustain people in the struggle for climate justice, whatever shape that takes. Can we try to be more in touch with nature ourselves? Our reading for today comes from the conclusion of the first ever Christian sermon. So if you're wondering where the first ever Christian sermon is, you can look, Acts 2. Immediately following the Pentecost event in Acts, the Apostle Peter stands up to those who are assembled. He talks about God's revelation in Jesus and then concludes with the section that we have for today in which he calls on people to repent and receive then the forgiveness of God and the Holy Spirit. Repentance has its roots in the Hebrew word, for sh Hebrew word shuv, which literally means to turn around. Fundamentally, Peter wants his audience to return to God and save themselves from the corruption of, of that generation. And I have to say, this is something that Reinhold Niebuhr would wholeheartedly agree with. We need to name our self-interest and be honest about it. We need to name the harm that our living has caused in the natural environment, which it has, and then figure out what it looks like to return to God and seek after love and justice. We all seem to find God in and around us and see that, experience it, let it inspire us. The current environmental crisis is a complex issue. There are a lot of different elements to it, and I don't expect us all to just completely change our lives on a dime. But I do hope we can see the role that religious people can play, particularly in having the courage to name our self-interest, again, a very difficult thing, and ask questions about what is just, as well as seeking to find God in all of life around us. Our part in the grand solution might be a small one, but that shouldn't leave us discouraged. If we believe in God, then God is at work all around us, working for good. We are only part of a much larger puzzle. Catastrophe might await us, but then again, it might not. Either way, all we can do is live out our faith as best we can, because we need to do it, not just for ourselves, but for the generations that will come after us.